Hey, what is up you guys? Today we're going to be doing another enclosure update for one of my favorite reptiles. So as you can see, I'm standing next to an enclosure. This house is my day gecko reptile. And it is a basic 20 long enclosure that has been converted into a vertical style. I've had Reptar since he was a tiny baby and could fit into a little deli cup. And he's been in the same enclosure for all of those years. I've made moderate adjustments to it over time as he grew, but overall he stayed in this 20 vertical enclosure. I really want to get him into something bigger and more beautiful so that he can really shine and stand out in his new environment. I don't know if you've seen these videos going around YouTube of Ikea transformations into plant greenhouses. I've watched a lot of them in the last couple months and they have really made me think, can I turn an Ikea cabinet into a reptile vivarium for one of my animals? And I think I've figured out just the way to do it. This is a challenge I can't wait to try out and I can't wait to bring you guys along with me. So stay tuned, we're gonna get started. All right, you guys, I've got my Ikea cabinet here. It is the Fabricor model, if you are trying to follow this as a tutorial at home. But I think any of their metal and glass cabinets would work really well. What was important for me was to make sure that the dimensions of the inside of this cabinet was bigger than Reptar's current enclosure. That's really what I based this decision off of. I really like the color of this cabinet too, but the dimensions were the most important factor for me. Now, let's get this box open so we can get started putting it together. Here is the completed Fabricor instructions. Um, this is what it's gonna look like when it's all done. It looks pretty self-explanatory, so I'm gonna get started and put this thing together. comes with its own little keys. That's cool, so I can lock it. I love that. Now I won't go into too much detail on how I build this cabinet because all IKEA furniture is pretty much the same. You just follow their basic instructions that they give you and you put it together all on your own. And it's more tedious than anything, really. stressful. All right, you guys, I have put this cabinet together. There it is. That's the whole thing. I've made a huge mess in my reptile room, as you can see, and even like outside of my reptile room. So I think for today, I'm going to leave the enclosure exactly like this. I'm not going to put the door on because I don't want that door to be in the way while I'm working on the background and while I'm working on sealing it. And I really just need to sit and stare at this enclosure for a moment and figure out how I'm gonna make it waterproof. Um, Let's go ahead and start sealing this cabinet to make sure it's watertight and that the metal won't rust over time. You'll notice the very first thing I did was tape up some sheets of paper so that we can keep some of the glass on the sides for viewing. I didn't want to cover the entire glass panel because I think it would be pretty cool to be able to see inside of this cabinet from different angles. I'm sealing the entire thing with several coats of Flex Seal. I sprayed this on the inner surface of the cabinet over any glass, metal, or exposed hardware. I let each coat dry for at least 24 hours before starting the next coat. I continued to add coats until I couldn't see any light through the Flex Seal on any sides of the enclosure. In total, I think I used between four and six cans of Flex Seal spray before I was done. After it was dry, I pulled the paper and tape off the glass cabinet looked something like this. Next, I decided to fill all the edges in with silicone to really make sure that water can't seep between the cracks. Flex Seal doesn't stick to silicone, that's why I made sure to do this step after the sealant application. I also pressed the silicone in and wiped off any excess. Once every edge was filled in, it was time to remove the top. Eventually, I wanted to replace the solid metal top piece with wire mesh so that I could put my lighting on top of the cabinet instead of inside. I needed help for this part because, scary, so these are not my hands, but we used a Dremel to cut through the thin metal. Then we removed this top piece. Finally, it was time to start the background. I struggled a lot trying to mount the cork to this cabinet so I could spray foam around it. I'm using regular insulation expanding foam for this build. Every 20 to 30 minutes, I would come back and add more spray foam until the cork was locked in place. I continued to add expanding foam across the entire back and press other wood and cork pieces into it. This foam will give the background texture and that 3D element we're looking for. We're going to be carving most of this foam away on the next step, 
So if you make a mistake or there's a part you don't really like, you'll be able to change it later. Over the next several days, I continued to cover every inch of the background with expanding foam. I left several bare inches of space at the bottom for substrate. After adding expanding foam, I let it dry for a few days before moving on to the next step. Then it was time for my least favorite part, carving. When you make backgrounds out of expanding foam, you have to carve it down afterwards. Not only does this help you get the exact shape you want, but when the foam is all puffy and shiny, whatever you're going to add to the outside of it in the next step, whether it's silicone or Gorilla Glue, won't stick to the foam until the outer shell is carved away. So this step is very important. After most of the carving was done, this is what I was left with. I did have to go back in with the foam and fill in some patchy spots, then carve those down again. But I think you guys get the point. Once the foam was carved the way I wanted it, I could move on to making it look more natural. There's a lot of different methods for building enclosure backgrounds, but for this build, I decided to cover the spray foam with Gorilla Glue and then press on Eco Earth or other substrate. In the past, I've also used the silicone method where you kind of do the same thing, but cover everything with silicone instead of Gorilla Glue. You can learn more about this method in my Blue Tongue Skink Bioactive Build video the silicone method is a bit cheaper overall, but I actually prefer the Gorilla Glue method instead. In my opinion, it's easier to apply and doesn't dry as quickly as silicone, so you can work in bigger sections. Gorilla Glue also sticks to damp or wet substrate, unlike silicone, where everything has to be bone dry, otherwise it doesn't cure properly, and your background won't stick. But as you can see, I'm applying sections of glue to the spray foam and using my fingers to make sure everything gets covered. Then I'm covering the glue with a thick layer of Eco Earth and letting it sit until it's dry. One very important thing to remember if you haven't used Gorilla Glue before is that it expands. So you have to keep a close eye on each section you're doing and press down any of the bubbles that form. Otherwise, your background is going to come out looking kind of weird. I continued doing this until the first side was covered, and then I let it dry overnight. The next day, I lifted the cabinet up and removed as much of the excess Eco Earth as I could. Later, I reused this Eco Earth so there was less waste. Whatever didn't come off right away, I gently vacuumed up. As you can see in this clip, there are some gaps where you can still see the spray foam. As annoying as it was, I'm a perfectionist, so I had to go back in and add more glue anywhere I thought was too thin. Finally, the tank was done. Just kidding, that was only one side. I had to go through this entire process two more times on both remaining sides before it was over. But I didn't feel like filming it all three times, and if you need to see it again, you guys can rewind a little bit. To really make sure the bottom of the cabinet held water, I took the glass shelves that came with it and cut them to form a makeshift tank. I siliconed everything together, let it dry, and then tested it with a gallon of water. I came back a few hours later and there were no leaks. I siphoned the water out, feeling way more confident about this cabinet. Finally, it was time. The enclosure was sealed, the background and sides were complete, the bottom was watertight. It was time to move that bus. And I guess by that, I mean it was time to make a home out of this cabinet. Even though there are already plenty of climbing opportunities in this enclosure, I wanted to add another branch for my day gecko to give him more basking options. I took a piece of driftwood from my collection and using aquarium putty, I attached it to the build. I gave the putty a few hours to cure before moving on to the next step. Now it was time to start filling this cabinet. I started with my drainage, a layer of Lekka balls to prevent excess water from sitting in the soil and causing mold. I kept adding them until there were several inches of drainage. Then to separate the drainage from the soil, I cut a piece of plastic weed barrier to the correct size. It's important that the weed barrier is a bit bigger than the bottom of this enclosure. So the sides curl up and limit how much dirt can fall through the corners or edges. I made my own substrate mix using ReptiSoil, Eco Earth, Play Sand, and Aquarium Substrate. I'll leave the links in the description below for all of the products I'm using in this video. I wanted to make sure the substrate layer was very deep to give the plant roots room to grow and the cleanup crew more space to explore. After adding a thick layer of substrate, I could start arranging my plants. The very first plant I added was Sansevieria, or a snake plant. Reptar is a pretty large lizard. He's well over nine inches long and has been known to be kind of rough on plants. So it was really important for me to choose plants that have strong leaves that won't break if he jumps or climbs on them. 
I picked this pothos for the same reason. Pothos can grow these incredible aerial roots that allow it to grow vertically up trees and rocks. I attached it to the back of this build to provide cover for Reptar so he feels less out in the open. Next, I used some super glue to attach a few bromeliads. This pink one actually had to get moved later on, so it'll be in a different spot for the final reveal. To pull the background together, I also glued on some live java moss to certain spots. Once this stuff grows in and starts to cover more of the sections of wood and cork, I think it will look really cool. And the last plant I added was another Sansevieria. I also went ahead and added my cleanup crew, starting with these papaya isopods. These small invertebrates are the key ingredient to a thriving bioactive enclosure. I also added a colony of springtails, but I must not have filmed that step because I can't find the footage for it anywhere. The last thing this enclosure needed was a thick leaf layer at the bottom. These leaves give the cleanup crew something to hide under so they don't get seen by Reptar. They will also slowly eat the leaves and break them down into nutrients for the plants. Now I must admit, the plants were looking a little sad during their relocation. So I had to give them a few weeks to recover and grow strong roots before introducing Reptar to his new home. During this time, I made sure to finish up the exterior of the cabinet. First things first, this cabinet needed a lid since we cut the top off of it months ago. I cut a square of thick wire to size and taped it in place. Then, since I wanted the entire cabinet hooked up to my automatic misting system, I taped on the corner pieces that will hold the spray nozzles. With some help, we drilled holes through the top of the cabinet where the screws will go. I put a bead of silicone around the entire edge, and then I put the wire into place. The two corner mounts for the misting system really helped keep the wire flat against the top of the cabinet. The back corners won't have any spray nozzles, so we secured the mesh with a screw on either side. Then we cut the excess wire away so we could attach the spray nozzles. After a day to dry, the top was ready for me to add my lighting. For plant lighting, I'm using an Arcadia Jungle Dawn LED strip. This is one of my favorite brands to use to light up my builds and for amazing plant growth. UVB is also vital to day geckos, who spend plenty of time soaking in the sun's rays. To simulate this, I'm using a VivTech Jungle Cover UVB bulb. Lastly, I'm using a low wattage heat bulb that is hooked up to a thermostat to make sure the cabinet stays in the correct temperature range for Reptar. Well, it is finally time to move Reptar to his new home. As you can see, I'm sitting on the floor here in my reptile room. Reptar is over here to my left, and then his new tank is right behind me to my right over here. Now I'm gonna be honest with you guys, he is not the most handleable um, reptile. Day geckos are not known for being very hands-on pets. They're very flighty, they can run very fast and they're very easily stressed. So he's not in my hands often. That being said, he does eat from my hands. He eats from tongs just fine. Um, he's comfortable with me sitting next to him like this, but I'm very hands off with him. I try not to grab him unless I absolutely have to. So we're gonna see how this goes. Now my first plan is I have a couple mealworms in here and I'm hoping that I can just lure him onto the glass door and then we can close him in this enclosure and I won't even have to touch him. If that doesn't work, then I'm gonna go ahead and try and grab him. And then if that doesn't work, I actually have one last like backup plan, but I'm hoping that this will do the trick because he's usually pretty good about eating for me. So let us see if Reptar wants to move to his new home. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and unlock his enclosure and let's go ahead and open this. So like I said, I'm gonna try and see if he will wanna go on his own. So let's see if this will work and trick him into going in here. He's usually pretty good at following the tongs. That being said, I don't make him leave his enclosure pretty much ever, so um, we'll see if he actually follows them out. There we go. Oh, well, we'll let him have that one. Good thing I have a couple more. I'm gonna sit down. Oh, he's running away now. <laughs> I really don't wanna have to grab you. All right, round two, let's see. God dang it. He is fast, isn't he? Got one leg out. Oh. 
<laughs> nope, he is on to me. Day geckos have this ability to avoid predators um, by dropping some of their scales. So when a predator grabs onto them in the wild, they will just um, fall off the scales that the, the predator has grabbed and then the day gecko can get away. That's kind of why I'm hesitant to grab him with my hands too roughly. Um, I don't want him to get super scared and lose a bunch of scales. Day geckos can also drop their tails um, and that is also something I don't really want to happen to him. So the less stress we can induce the better, but he is really sussing me out. So what I'm gonna actually do is get some of this bigger clutter out of here. The plants are very overgrown. If I have to reach in there and grab him, I want it to be a little easier. I wanted to take this tank apart anyways. And I've cleared out the majority of his old enclosure here. I just pulled everything out so that it's easier for me to reach my hands in there and grab him. You probably can't see from where you are, but he is on the back of this piece of cork here. So if I could very carefully get the cork off of the background, maybe I could just slip him in that way. He's so over me. I know. All right. I've got him. He's biting me, but we're gonna get him into this new tank. All right, guy. We did it. Only um, some minor casualties. I don't know if you can see. Um, he did bite me a little bit in a couple spots, uh, but he's in his new home. Yay! <laughs> I want to update you guys really quick. Uh, I moved him successfully. As you can see, he didn't drop his tail or anything. He didn't drop any scales, which is good. I'm not going to film him anymore uh, today because I want him to settle in, but just wanted to let you guys know he is in here. The last thing I want to mention about this enclosure build is that I wish past me installed a drainage system. This cabinet gets misted several times throughout the day to maintain good humidity levels, which means a lot of water sits at the bottom of this cabinet. In a normal build, this wouldn't be an issue, except the water collects so quickly that it will eventually flood the soil if I didn't drain it out. In the end, I actually decided to run a tube to the very bottom of this enclosure. This tube is attached to an electric pump that can be turned on to suck all the water out of the bottom. It would have probably been easier to install a bulkhead from the very beginning, like the one I use for my dart frog enclosure, so the water can drip out naturally on its own. But hindsight, you know? Well, that is pretty much all I have for this enclosure build. I can't believe this IKEA cabinet went from looking like this to where it ended up. What do you think? Do you like it? Do you wish I did something differently? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to see more animal content, consider checking me out on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, or Patreon. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video.